Good morning and welcome to our service here at Tain and Fern Free Church. Can I invite you next Sunday evening after our evening worship to a congregational fellowship over Zoom? Uh, it would be good to spend some time together to hear someone sharing of how the Lord has come into their life. The details uh, to log into that Zoom are on your screen, so we shall, Lord willing, see you at that. Let's worship God, let's sing together in Psalm 104 in the Sing Psalms. The tune is Hifredol. Psalm 104 in the Sing Psalms. Praise the Lord, my soul, O oh, praise him. Lord, my God, you are so great. Let's sing to God's praise. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do come and worship you this Sabbath morning. We want to uh, direct our thoughts and our minds and our hearts towards you. We recognize that you are the God who is sovereign, who is in control of all things at all times. And may that be a comfort to each one listening today in, how, in whatever situations they find themselves in, that whatever trouble has arisen in recent days or has been ongoing, that they know that you, Lord, are the captain of the ship, that you have all things 
under your control and we can bring everything to the Lord in prayer. So Father, as we uh, search your word today, as we uh, explore with the Apostle Paul on this journey in Acts 27, Lord, we want to see how you led and guided him and indeed all who were on board that ship in that, in that time. Lord, you are the one who leads us and guides us and Jesus your son is the one who says that I am the way, the truth and the life. Lord, may we be on that road, the straight and the narrow path that leads us ultimately and eventually to the safe haven of Canaan's shore. We pray for our brothers and sisters throughout our denomination and we pray for uh, Chris Davidson and his wife Catherine as they continue to minister in the Merkinch. Lord, we recognise the poverty in that area of our city in Inverness. Uh, Lord, it's been even uh, recognised as the eighth worst place in Scotland, worst scheme in Scotland. And so we just pray for them that in the darkness, the light would shine. Gracious God, go before us today. Help us as we open your word as we speak to the young ones. May you be with us. May you help us in all that we do. We ask for the forgiveness of our many sins. Amen. Well, let me speak to uh, the young ones just uh, for a moment. Both of your ministers, both myself and Alistair, were both from Ireland. So we're quite used to going on a ship, on a boat. And maybe you're quite used to getting on a boat or a ferry uh, as well. Maybe you can remember times that you've been on one. But uh, I'm sure Alistair and I and others in the congregation have many experiences or stories of when we've got on one of these boats and the sea has been really rough. When I was a child, I didn't enjoy going on the ferry when it was rough. I would get seasick because the boat would be going up and down and side to side I really didn't enjoy it I thought is this ever going to end well one time on the ferry the boat lost all of its power and the captain of the ship he couldn't steer it and so he had to make an announcement not to the passengers but to any boats that were outside he had to keep on saying not in command, not in command. The captain didn't have control of the ship and so the ship was just drifting for hours, whichever way the sea took it. Well, we're going to read today a really fascinating story in uh, Acts 27 where Paul boarded a ship and things went for him bad to worse. They got caught in a hurricane, not just for a few hours, but for two weeks. There was no daylight. There was no stars at night. It was just complete darkness. The situation was completely out of their control. All 276 people on board. But you know, God was in control. That's what we're going to see today. He was in control of everything. He promised that not one person would be hurt, that everybody would reach the land in safety. And you'll have to stay tuned to see if they did. You know, Jesus is wanting to be the captain of your life. He wants to lead you and guide you and steer you in the right direction. It doesn't mean if you're young or if you're old that then life's going to be easy and plain sailing. But if we ask him, to be our captain, then he will lead us to safety. There's a psalm I love to sing, Psalm 46, that says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Amen, guys. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. So let's clasp our hands, close our eyes, and we'll pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, read that passage together then in Acts 27. In the New Testament, Acts 27. And we're going to break into the story at verse 13. Let's hear God's word. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee, the shelter of a small island called Coda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sartus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen, just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the fourteenth night we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he had said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. 
cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail in the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached the land in safety. Amen. This is the word of God. You know, when I purchased uh, my new car a few years ago, my top priority was just to ensure that the engine wouldn't overheat as I went from one place to another. However, I was also intrigued by the gadgets that this new car possessed. And some of these are, are fairly standard in all of our cars nowadays, but one in particular was the cruise control. I love now heading down the A9 and being able to sit back comfortably, take my feet off the pedals and let the car just cruise along. But you know, speaking of cruising and to switch the transport metaphor, if you really want to cruise, you don't do it in a car, but you board a ship. And there are seldom days that you ever cross the minch, as I was saying earlier to the young folk. Instead, you need to head to the Mediterranean and cruise around the lovely Greek islands. Well, that's what Paul does here in Acts 27. As he boarded the ship bound for the city of Rome, which cruised through the Med. Well, granted, he didn't spend much of that fortnight with his feet up and being waited upon, or any of it actually. Instead, he was regarded, along with many others on board, as a prisoner. He was going to stand trial before Caesar. And if Paul was found guilty at this trial, then he would be executed along with the others. So, come aboard as we arrive at two different ports, as we arrive at desperation and destination. Desperation and destination. We begin then, headed for desperation. If you can, uh, since you're at home, you may wish to pull up a map of this journey. I find it fascinating tracking it as I did my own preparation this week. All you have to do is uh, Google uh, map of Acts 27. Do it now, do it later. Uh, it may help just paint the picture for you. We break into the journey though at verse 13. When Paul the prisoner has just finished piping up, telling them it's a bad idea to sail away from this port we're in, fair havens. We should stay here. Instead of listening to Paul, the centurion who was on board, who was, who was leading everybody, the soldiers and the sail sailors, he dismisses Paul. He just disregards what Paul says. And he decides, along with the others, we're going to make this just short 40 mile journey up the coast of, of Crete to a little, to a better port called Phoenix. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we read in verse 14, before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down the island. They had already spent days at sea by this point. They had gone in and out of different ports they were onto their second ship as they now ventured into deeper waters. You know, the wind had, uh, throughout all of these days so far, it had slowed their progress. But now this hurricane would change their course. It isn't difficult for people like us in particular 
to try and picture this scene in our minds. Many of you have spent your lives just living beside the seaside. Others of you have fished in these waters or sailed the seven seas in your careers. And a lot of the time, it's wonderful, it's peaceful, it's calm. But then it erupts. The still waters are stirred up to a foam and a roar. And how dangerous and how vulnerable it would be to be out on the ocean in conditions like these. Well, as the crew allowed themselves to be driven by the winds, we see and we read there that they took at least five measures to protect the ship and to save their lives. First of all, they secured the lifeboat in verse 17. Remember, it's Luke who is writing Acts, who is writing this account. Dr. Luke is being thrust into action here as they attempt to haul this dinghy on board, which was being towed behind the vessel. It's all hands on deck. But secondly, they used ropes to undergird the ship. This was an emergency measure helping to prevent the, the hull of the ship from breaking apart in a storm. Thirdly, they, they lowered the sea anchor in verse 18. And the purpose of this would be to slow the ship's movement from crest to crest on the waves and to try and keep them on the course they wanted to go. Fourthly and fifthly, over the next three days, as the storm continued to batter them, they jettisoned the cargo and the tackle. All movable objects were hauled overboard in an attempt to protect the structure of the ship. But despite their Herculean efforts, the voyagers were still left at the mercy of the elements. Don't overlook, though, who's on board here in the midst of this storm. Yes, the criminals, the sailors and the soldiers, but so were the Christians, Luke and Paul. They were in this storm too. The Christians, Luke and Paul, were experiencing, yes, the physical and the emotional turmoil just like the rest of them. When we uh, stick the cruise control on in our cars, to an extent, we sit back, we relax, and we enjoy the ride. That is rarely, if ever, the Christian's experience through life. Christians are not exempt from going through the storms. The promises of God, they don't alleviate the experiences of life. Don't let anybody tell you that the Christian life is plain sailing. Christians, like anybody else, are not immune from illness or from relationships breaking down or from losing their jobs. Difficult, dark and stormy days will come and perhaps have come. But, and this is the great comfort for the Christians in the storm, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. But these guys on board this ship, they didn't have any of the fancy gadgets, no cruise control, no autopilot, no compasses or emergency telephones. Their navigation systems were dependent on the light of day and the stars of the night. Just this week, Ailey and I went out for a walk in the evening and I, I, I love looking up and seeing the stars. As I saw the stars and then looked down towards the sea, my mind went immediately to this passage. 
and uh, Ailey get, got a preview of the sermon as I thought about Paul and Luke and the 200 plus crew on board but this verse, verse 20, for many days neither sun nor stars appeared, only darkness. Can you picture that? Neither sun nor stars appeared, only darkness. As the men scrambled around the deck, being tossed by the wind and the waves, staring into the dead of the night, it was little wonder that they conclude. We finally gave up any hope of being saved. They endeavoured to use every trick of the trade to rescue the situation, but all their efforts left them helpless and hopeless. They were lost at sea and had no hope of rescue. Remember though that they had disregarded Paul's words, the man of God and his counsel back in verse 9. Do they wish now that they had listened to Paul? Not to sail away from fair havens, but to have stayed there, to have sheltered there, to have remained on the secure, solid, dry ground. Do they wish they had listened when now it seems too late? When they were now on the brink of desperation, on the brink of death? How many times have you disregarded the word of God? sat in a church and heard the invitation to come to be rescued because you are sinking in your sin but you disregarded the call disregarded the message because you are perhaps safe in the harbour of this world with the worldly goods around you but have we not seen so many of these worldly goods stripped away in the last 10 months the call to come is still there. And let me just ask you a question in the form of a chorus. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Will the clouds, when the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor hold or firm remain? Desperation. Well, we come secondly then to destination. Paul obviously thought that this would be the perfect time just after they have come to the brink of their lives to speak up to the crew and the criminals. They were completely exhausted, starving, anticipating death. So he begins in verse 21 basically saying, I told you so. But then he moves past that and he rouses them to keep up their courage. Everything is going to be okay. How can he say that? There's nothing to be encouraged about. There's everything to be discouraged about. Nothing around them seemed to show any signs of hope. Nothing in the world could help them. It was as if they were entombed by this black canvas. The darkness painted the picture of imminent death. But isn't that so often the picture of the gospel? Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. The prophet Isaiah says, See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Into the darkness the light shines. John Calvin says, There is no doubt that the Lord intended by this to make the grace of their deliverance all the more notable. Into the darkness the light shines. And that is why Paul can encourage them because God has said so. 
an angel appeared to Paul the night before, verse 23, promising that not one of their lives would be lost. As we come to verse 27, they were two weeks in now to this horrific journey. But the sailors sensed that land was nearby. And even though they couldn't see, they probably could hear the water crashing off the rocks. And this was both good and bad news. Obviously good because the possibility of survival was revived. But potentially bad because the likelihood of crashing against the rocks was heightened. You know, perhaps the possibility of finally reaching land drove the sailors in two opposite directions because we read in verse 29 that some of the men started praying. But in verse 30, others of them became so selfish and they thought of every man for themselves and they started getting the lifeboat ready and they were out of there. They were escaping the first sign of getting to land. And even though you've heard the message, the promises of God, just like these sailors had, and yet they wanted to run, my friend, you don't need to run. Maybe you've been running away from this message, from our God. But you don't need to run. You need to trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Believe in him and lean not on your own understanding. But Paul notices these selfish men as they try to get away and he he alerts the, the soldiers and the centurion and they halt the men. The ropes of the lifeboat are cut and they have to remain on board. The promise was for all of them that all of them would be saved. Did you notice though that Two weeks ago, the centurion wouldn't even bat an eyelid at this prisoner, Paul. But now two weeks later, the centurion is obeying Paul. He's doing what Paul tells him. In verses 33 to 38, Paul encourages the men to sit for their last supper on this journey. It was an opportunity to thank God and to worship him. You know, it seems that this meal was a strengthening both physically and spiritually. The men feared that their life was over. But Paul tells them again, God has promised that you will not even lose a single hair from your head. We need to remember that Paul boarded this ship as a prisoner. Yet here he is leading helping these men physically, but a wonderful example to them spiritually. As he broke bread and gave thanks for them to eat it, I wonder for how many on board was this more than just a meal? Well, in verse 39, amazingly, then the promise began to shine through because daylight came. What a moment that must have been. Two weeks in the darkness and then very gradually the sun rises over the horizon, illuminating 276 faces on board, illuminating the ship and incredibly land ahoy. Just consider this. Was it fortune or was it our heavenly father who guided that ship to that land? The land that we know now is Malta, and Malta means refuge. If you see it on a map, you will, if you have your map there, you will see that if they missed Malta, if they didn't land there and beach on that little island, then it's 200 miles until they reach Tunisia. God is in control. So energised and encouraged, they jettisoned the remaining cargo, they lowered the anchor, they untied the rudder, they hoisted the foresail. It was full steam ahead as they attempted to reach the shore. Verse 41, the ship struck a sandbar and it ran aground. 
It didn't matter though, they, they were close enough, those who were capable would swim to the shore, the rest would get there any way they could. The end of this nightmare was finally in sight. But there was one final, life-threatening hurdle to surmount. You see, the soldiers knew that if any of those prisoners escaped, it would be their own lives that would pay for it. So they thought, after all they'd heard, even the promises of God, even being led to safety by God, they would still kill the prisoners, including Paul. But amazingly, the centurion intervenes because of Paul. He once disregarded him, now he's saving him. Because of the man of God, because of his witness, because even in the worst days of their lives, Paul displayed the love of God to his fellow passengers. He was an example to others. And so, one by one, the sailors, the soldiers, the prisoners, and even Paul make it to the land. God's promise was fulfilled. He was sovereign through this journey. God was in control the whole time. He was the captain of the ship. None of us, not least the Christian, are immune from difficulty and challenges in this life. There will be days when the sun doesn't rise and the stars don't shine. Maybe Maybe you're there today. No preacher can say to every individual in his congregation, I know how you feel. But the preacher, because of the word of God, can say, I know what to do. We can say, lean on the everlasting arms. Trust in the Lord, your God, that he is with you. And believe that he has it all under control as he leads you ultimately and eventually to the safe haven of Canaan's shore. I asked earlier, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Well, the Christian, the believer in God can sing, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Amen. This is the Word of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control. And we pray, Lord, for those whose lives today seem out of control. Perhaps the sun is not shining, the stars are not in the night sky. Oh, may they see the light of the world, Jesus Christ, shining into their darkness. You who are our refuge and strength. Go before us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's conclude by singing together in Psalm 107 in the Sing Psalms. The tune is Morven. We're going to sing from verse 10 to verse 16. Some sat in darkness and in gloom. In chains of iron held, they scorned the ways of God Most High, against his words rebelled. Psalm 107, to God's praise.
Now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you both now and forevermore. Amen.